Okay, cool. Um, my name is Gloria Mar, and I work at the Office of Research Compliance under the big umbrella, the Office of Research. Um, we at the Office of Research Compliance, we're in charge of the regulatory aspects of research, and we also oversee what it is, the negotiation of agreements involving research and sponsored projects at UTPA. Um, Roger asked me to come and talk to you all today about how UTPA manage IP. And um, I would like to know by showing of hands how many of you are affiliated with UTPA, the student employee staff. So, okay, pretty good. Um, so, the very first question that we ask or people ask us is what is intellectual property? Yeah, the definition in the the screen is the Black's Law Dictionary definition of intellectual property. I usually call it, you know, it's a set of intangible assets that are commercially, um, but of, of value commercially of the human uh, intellect. So as any other asset, you can sell it, you can trade it, you can rent it, right? So that's how we look at intellectual property. So um, how intellectual property is created in a university setting, um, and it's very unique to something that we call research, that it's basically the art of not knowing what we're doing, right? That's why we call it research, otherwise we will, we will expect a result or a given result. Uh, and because research, we, uh, the results are not expected, we cannot promise results to somebody when somebody contracts with the university for a research project, right? Um, in terms of UTPA, this is how UTPA managed the IP that it's created under the UT institutions. It's uh, intellectual property developed under the university time if you're an employee or using university resources if you're a student or a faculty member here, it's automatically owned by the Board of Regents of the UT system. There is an exception to that. Um, and that exception is scholarly work uh, related to your area of expertise. And that just, it's limited to copyrights. Another thing to consider if you are developing IP at UTPA is if your research is sponsored somehow, there is a law out there called the Beidou Act. And basically Beidou Act allows the institutions to own the IP of the research uh, that it's, it is as a result of the research that is being federally funded so that the university can commercialize it and have private investor kind of promote uh, that investment that the federal government had done for the uh, benefit of the public. But because of that, Beidou Act reserved the right of a royalty-free uh, perpetual license to use and allow others to use in the government for the own government purpose, the right to, for, you, for them to use that invention that you came up with or that discovery that you came up with in that federally funded research project. Let's say that you're working here or you're a student here and you came up with this big idea or you came up with this good research idea and you came up with an invention. So what's next? Um, we have an office called a tech transfer office here at UTPA. I don't work for the tech transfer office, but I do review their agreements. Um, and basically, the tech transfer office is the one that it's charged with the responsibility of overseeing and managing the IP that is created in uh, under UT research projects. They're the going to they're going to be the ones uh, responsible for evaluating your eventual disclosure disclosure, uh, determining whether or not they want to go ahead and protect it. Um, they're going to do an evaluation if there is a market outside, who they want to market it to, and eventually, if all of those goes through, we will be able to license it to an ideal uh, local company, or it can be uh, an outside company as well. So, the very first step that you need to 
uh, do when you came up with an invention or uh, a discovery is to go to the Office of Technology Transfer and fill out what we call an invention disclosure. It's basically a document where you describe um, your invention or your discovery and how you came up with the idea. Uh, it summarizes all the characteristics of it. Um, it tells us who participated in the invention. Um, if funds were used, you know, are those funds coming from the federal government, if it's state funded or university funded. Um, please, if you're a student, keep copies of your lab notebooks, uh, any document, films, anything that can help you uh, sustain a claim that you are an inventor. Be prepared in case that somebody uh, challenge your invention, saying, well, you know, we all participated in this as a group, and in X person is claiming all the credit on this invention or this discovery. So be prepared with all that supporting documentation. Also, there's something, if you're participating in a research that, that involves what we call background IP, background IP may be subject to a patent and it may be owned by somebody else. Before you start engaging in research with background IP, make sure you have authorization or a license from the owners of that background IP. Because otherwise, what might end up happening is you came up with this discovery or this invention that it has that background in IP built into it, and because you didn't have authorization to use it, now you cannot move forward with your invention because you don't have the authorization from that, that important piece of your invention. Uh, when it comes to the evaluation process, the Office of Technology Transfer will evaluate the novelty of your invention. Uh, does it solve a problem or a need of the community? What is the potential commercial value of it? Uh, if, if there is a market for it and if it's worth protecting. If after doing all that evaluation, the institution determined that it's not worth protecting or moving forward with it, basically the institution will release that disclosure, that uh, invention or that discovery back to you. So if you decide to move forward on your own, you're more than happy to do that. There's uh, several ways to protect your uh, your IP. Uh, one of them is through agreements, legal agreements, legal binding agreements. There's one we call confidentiality agreements or non-disclosure agreements. Um, there's one that it's called material transfer agreement. And the other one is what we call a collaborative agreement um, that has specific clauses that will protect your disclosure, your invention, or your discovery before it is permanently protected through a means of a patent or uh, a trademark in the case of a trademark or a copyright. Um, so talking about copyrights. So copyrights um, are enforceable the moment that they're being put in a tangible mean. So if it's a poem, the minute that you write it out, you put it in paper, that's a tangible mean. If it's a picture, the moment that you take a picture, you have the copyrights to that picture. Um, if it's a film, the, mi the minute that you're making the film, you have copyrights to that film. You cannot copyright ideas, okay? It has to be in a tangible mean. Copyrights are enforceable just by putting them in that tangible mean. You don't have to register in the Library of Congress if you don't want to, but if you really want to protect your copyrights in front of somebody else, it is highly advisable for you to register your copyrights with the Library of Congress. The second set of IP rights um, that you may have in terms of protecting your, your invention and your um, discovery is uh, it's through patents. There's three types of patents. We have utility patents, that will basically cover, cover the majority of mechanical devices or new materials or new processes. We have uh, design patents that will basically, it's covering the shape of a bottle or the looks of an item or the ornamental value of that item itself. And then we have plant patents. And basically, this is to protect a new variety of plants uh, that can be asexually reproduced. So basically, we use those in the agriculture field. 
Uh, patents are very expensive. Uh, a full patent can uh, cost can range from fifteen thousand dollars to thirty thousand. There are some that are more costly than that. It takes time to get a patent finally approved. Um, the university will choose often to go to a patent a provisional patent that will last a year, and during that year, the university will be continuing the evaluation process for the potential commercial value and trying to find out a licensee, a potential licensee. And um, and then uh, it will be, uh, they, they will decide whether or not they want to convert your provisional patent to a final patent. So uh, we have also trademarks. Trademarks basically is a brand name. Trademarks are also registered through uh, the office, the US um, Patent and Trademark Office, as well as patent. You have to fill them out with them. And basically, trademark will identify services or goods that are just particular to you. Uh, perfect example are the golden arches of McDonald's. We have trade secrets, and the value of protecting trade secrets is in having information remain secret, and because it's secret, that means that I have a competitive advantage over other, uh, other people. But when it comes to the university setting, trade secrets and the university are not good friends because the minute that we are presented with a confidentiality agreement that includes trade secrets, we will say to the other party, you know, if you make me sign a trade secret agreement, uh, the minute that I will sign it, I will be breaching that contract because the university mission is to promote research and generalizable knowledge and to put that knowledge to the use of the public. And the minute that we do that, we have to publish, we have to communicate. So there's no, there's no room for trade secrets, basically, in the university research setting. Then uh, the Office of Technology Transfer were moved towards uh, finding the potential licensee. And when the license comes out and about, well, remember Beidou Act? If it's federally funded, we have to reserve, make sure that we reserve that right for the federal government and we have to communicate that to our potential licensee, that the federal government will have also a right to the, uh, to the invention that we're licensing them. The very first thing that the university does with a license agreement is to recover all those patent prosecution costs because it's very expensive. And it will include also like a description of how the royalties will go and how it's going to be distributed here at university campus. So when the agreements are needed, let's say that between you make an invention disclosure at the Office of Technology Transfer and before a provisional patent is filed or you get a final patent, the NDAs, the MTAs, and the collaborative research agreements are very useful. Basically, the NDAs defines uh, what is considered confidential information. So because it's not protected yet, I want to make sure that if I have to talk to a consultant to find a potential market for my invention, that that consultant is not going to take that information away from me. It's going to run out and fill out patent claiming that he or she is the inventor. So we define what confidential information is. Uh, we describe the limited use or the purpose for uh, us sharing that confidential information to that third person. And it also describe how the confidential information is to be handled. Um, that will be, that agreement will be necessary just to start talking about your invention with somebody else if your invention is not protected yet through a copyright or a trademark or uh, whatever will be the, the, the IP right that you're looking at. The other type of agreement is a mature transfer. Let's say that you talked to this person and now this person is willing to do some research for you. Now you need to transfer that invention, the actual thing that you have invented to this person or what you have discovered to this person. We then can do a mature transfer agreement. And it basically governs the transfer of tangible materials to uh, another institution. And we want to limit who gets access to that material and for what purposes. And we want to limit the research that you're going to do with that material. 
we want to learn how you know the results came out and we want to not uh, to be notified in confidence of those results and nobody else can have access to those then when we get those results back we can decide whether you know if, it, if we can move forward with uh, further research with your invention or your um, or your, of your or your discovery what happens if you're a student and you're working in a thesis and you have disclosed an invention and we're still in the process of evaluating your disclosure well you can still the, this is the, the the policy of the university we won't prevent you from doing your thesis we were delayed probably presentation we will ask for a 30-day period to uh, file a provision, provisional patent right away and as soon as we hear back from the PTO office, the office, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, what's, you know, it's safe for you now to go ahead and present your thesis or defend your thesis. Um, it will be only a delay and it cannot be an unnecessarily de delay. So do you have any questions regarding how UTPA manage IP here? Um, is there something that pertains specifically to you that you will like cl clarification on? Yes, sir. What's the current situation on protection of genetic sequences? Of genetic sequences? The disclosure? Yeah, are they patentable, copyrightable? How do we protect something that's a, a genetic discovery? DNA sequence? I'm not aware of an invention disclosure of that, of, of that topic under the Office of Technology Transfer. Um, so I can give you like a, like the status of it. Um, in terms of, I'm, I'm really not aware. I mean, that's not the area of expertise that I will manage. But if something new comes out and about that it's like a, a sexually reproduced plants or genetic or something or a new process come out and about, then the process is for UTPA for whoever is doing that and working that invention to disclose to the Office of Technology Transfer and they'll move forward with the, uh, with the evaluation process. Yes, sir. So, so uh, I hope you don't mind my question, uh, but I'll say anyway. Uh, uh, within the university, within the UT system, uh, mm -hmm. there is a tremendous amount of interest on the part of the region commercializing technology uh, out of uh, universities. So uh, what we've heard here is pretty much kind of here's how we do it and uh, I know compliance and following the rules is, is very, very important and has been traditionally paramount within uh, how technology management and commercialization has been at the university. Uh, but with the medical school, for example, and uh, 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 the uh, shooting rockets off on Boca Chica, our physicists, uh, or UTP involved with that, uh, you know, there's really going to be, uh, you know, we've had one successful spin out here at the university, and that's it. Uh, so I think our performance really needs to improve dramatically within the next five years, especially with the medical school. So are we, are we prepared to do that? So it's nice IP stuff, but you know, we've got to produce companies, we've got to produce licensing revenue, uh, we got to a return for all that money we're spending, at least the uh, uh, benchmark to get I guess that will be a question for the new university to as we move forward with the consolidation um, and what are the plans for the new university moving forward uh, technology commercialization. I know that there is a task force right now um, that it's looking at IP at the UT institutional UT system level and we're still waiting, waiting to hear back from the task force. So, uh, you know, traditionally people in tech transfer, uh, people in the system get fired in tech transfer all the time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a performance-based job, basically. You know, you've got all this research doing done and very bright people. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, we, I think we need to get much more aggressive in taking IP and actually managing and promoting it rather than just having compliance with that. I don't think that's going to work in the future. We're still waiting to see how the new structure for the new universe is going to look like in terms of technology transfer.
Yes, sir. So I guess following up on that question, I, as a small business owner and entrepreneur myself, um, you know, I speak with students a lot about my ideas out in the world, um, what I see out there and what, what, what students are seeing here. So I guess my question is, does it make financially and also legally advantageous for a small, for a small business owner to approach somebody at the school and say, I have this idea, let's develop it together. I know that the school owns some portion of the of the patent. Uh, so have you guys like figured out whether it means like economically and legally is it beneficial for our community as well as, you know, like students and professors? Because I feel like half the time I think there's this uh, either understanding or misunderstanding of like the school takes everything or don't do anything at school because otherwise they'll own something. Like, how do you feel about the interaction with the, like, the university and the community? Like, where do you see, like, the plan, I guess? Actually, if you're doing collaborative research, which means that you're bringing something to the table and you're going to be actively collaborating with our researchers here, the standard, uh, the inventorship law says that what, it's, what you bring and you develop is yours, what I bring and what I develop is mine, and what we do together is ours, and UTPA follows the same policy. When you go and disclose your invention, they will ask you who, who are the other inventors, and if other inventors are people from the community, or sponsors, potential sponsors are coming and working uh, hand in hand with us, we recognize ownership of their IP. The other thing that you can do is you can support or sponsor research here at UTPA, and uh, depending on, on, on your sponsored research agreement, we can give you the option to license whatever comes out of that sponsored research agreement. So it, you will have that benefit of the option and license it first. So it's still beneficial for, for people in the community. That would yeah, my, <clears throat> my question was um, how aggressive uh, is the IP office in defending like intellectual property? Like, let's say all of a sudden Apple starts ripping off Fiber Rio technology. Like, are you guys like, do you guys like attack them like a lot? Or are you guys so oh, let's sit back and see what we can do about this? I mean, it's Apple. Like, or can you give me an example? For example, like when your office actually did mobilize to defend some intellectual property that was produced by the university. In terms of patent infringement? Yes. Well, that's, uh, my office specifically done work with that. It will be technology transfer. I work for the research compliance area. Uh, but if there is a claim of a patent infringement that, that we basically bring that up to the UT system uh, OGC level, and they're gonna be taking care of that. Yeah, because it's the, the, the technology is owned by the Board of Regents. So that's when they, their legal department gets involved in that. There was a question. OK, I guess. Um, so I, uh, I graduated from here. I'm not currently a student. Um, so I was wondering if I can kind of answer any sort of advice. Uh, if I, I recently just uh, sold a little bit of uh, video footage with my Japanese. We have been doing a, a documentary on the uh, on Russian strike, and then uh, we had like had, had like a material uh, uh, materials uh, agreement uh, for them to use some of that. During which for like a non-student, they would have to come in and just like selling eyes and talking to you to advise on on that topic. We don't provide legal advice to uh, non-UT affiliated people right now. Um, we can certainly invite you to one of our um, trainings in material transfer agreement and non-disclosure agreements that are available for the campus community. And we can address any questions you may have regarding those. But we're at our at Office of Technology Transfer, it's, it's ma managing the IP coming out from the university. And because we can get questions in terms of you're using public resources and taxpayers' money to support private industry or people outside, you know, it's not, it's not the right thing to do. And then have a question. Um, I'm just wondering, say, say that we be actually, like say, say I work at Fire Rio, mm -hmm. or I created, I created the invention for Fire Rio, 
Uh, and the, I know the 50 50, right? So I have a personal interest in what I want to do with the patent, with the patents and the licensing. And I know the UG system has zero idea of, say, I'm going to like, like, my concept would be I want to I control a whole vertical, but the UG system sees more money or more, more possibilities in the short term to do licensing across a lot of companies. How, how, does the, how does that work when you have two different opinions about a patent and what to do with it and how, uh, how to make it financially, you know? Okay. When we have two different inventors, let's say from two different institutions, we put together what we call an inter-institutional uh, management plan in which the two parties decide who's going to manage actually the patent, patent persecution, and the maintenance costs, and the licensing, who's going to be actively doing all that. And we put, or we build clauses into that agreement in the event that we, we don't successfully license the technology, or let's say that UTPA abandons the licensing of the technology, or it's not able to successfully market it. Um, we can change the management to that other party so that the other party can take a chance to to uh, manage the actual invention. But it's 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 mutual mutual agreeable terms in an inter inter um, institutional agreement. Any other question? Well, thank you so much.